Returning to yesterday morning, let us remember that God is individual consciousness. God is the consciousness of the individual. God is your individual consciousness. Your individual consciousness is the storehouse of infinity, of infinite spiritual unfoldment. Now, in the light of that, I will read a few passages from Haggai, and uh, you will remember that the word house means consciousness. And since uh, we are speaking of your house, we will be speaking of your consciousness. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. He looked for much and lo, it came to little. And when he brought it home, I did blow upon it Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, (coughs) and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. This house This house is our individual consciousness. And uh, when this consciousness is what we call human, it is barren. It lacks the substance, the element, out of which spiritual or perfect harmonious demonstration must flow. This is true of everybody in their humanhood. In their humanhood, they can, we can all say, we have sown much and bring in little. We've worked hard, accomplished nothing. We've earned a lot and got nothing left to show for it. Because it came from this unenriched consciousness, this human consciousness, this barren consciousness. And... Uh, Out of that, of course, comes nothing. Then we're told, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. And then comes the instruction to go up into the mountain, to go up into high consciousness, to go up into the high places, and bring wood and build a house. And so we build a consciousness of spiritual truth, a temple of God, a divine consciousness. We build that every time we read spiritual literature, every time we meditate, every time we hear, every time we fill ourselves 
with the meat of life or the water of life or the wine of life or the bread of life, meaning the spiritual substance and food, we are building a temple of God, a house of God or house of spiritual consciousness, a consciousness of truth. Now then, when we have that, the Lord says, I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified. Ye looked for much, and it came to little. And when he brought it home, I did blow upon it. Certainly, out of the barrenness of human consciousness, regardless of what we build, it doesn't remain with us, it doesn't last. It gives no satisfaction. We eat and hunger again. We drink and thirst again. We do all the things of human life. We dance, and we go to theater, and we buy homes, and we have cars, and regardless of what we do, we find in it, out of the human consciousness, no satisfaction. Whereas, out of this spiritual awareness would come the same things, the same joys, the same food, the same clothing, but each bringing with it satisfaction and completeness. Now, as we come to the next chapter, we hear this. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. And be strong, O Joshua. And be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord. And work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you, when ye came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, Yet once, it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace. There, quickly, you have the Master's statement that man shall not live by bread alone. And again, I am the bread, I am the wine, I am the water. As we look to our personal selfhood for our wisdom or our good or our anything else in life, we will find that no matter what we draw out of it, it uh, will leave us with no sense of permanent good or satisfaction that is his saying that and ye run every man into his own house yes into his own intellect into his own sense of wisdom into his own spirituality into his own uh, religion instead of uh, the realization that God is my consciousness God the infinite invisible is the source and fount of my being and in going within, we do not go within to my own spirituality or my own goodness or my own strength or my own knowledge, but to this infinite invisible which when it flows, it flows to that water which we are told is the wellspring of life eternal. Now, the moment we come to that realization, and then we're told not only to be strong, but we're told, and work, for I am with you. We are given uh, that to do, which we are doing here this morning, which we do every time we open a book of scripture or of inspired writings, every time we sit down for a meditation, turning to the infinite source, that which brought forth all of the glories of earth, Every time we draw ourselves into it, we are fulfilling 
these passages and then we learn that with this the silver is mine saith the Lord and the gold we learn that even when it comes to our sense of physical supply silver and gold or body or health that it's God's and not ours how much is it how much is there of it then if it's God's it is infinite and the moment we think of it as ours uh, there comes this sense of finiteness and uh, regardless of how much we take in there's always nothing left over whereas uh, in the realization that the silver is mine the gold is mine this wisdom is God's this spirit is God's then the more that pours out the more is left over just as in the multiplication of loaves and fishes there were only five to begin with but twelve baskets full at the end and probably the cruise of oil that began with a few drops might have left a whole bottle full over at the end now during our series at the Alexander Young Hotel last year I told the story of the experience that gave me the first inner glimpse of immortality it was very much like the story of the orange tree in the chapter on supply in the infinite way you remember that we have come to the conclusion that the fruits on the trees the crops the dollars in our bank or pocket that this is not supply that these are the forms which supply assumes in our experience these are the forms of supply which are given us for our use for our exchange for our eating and so forth drinking but they're not supply or eventually we'd eat them all up or drink them all up or spend them all now no one can ever lessen their supply because God itself is the supply there is no such thing as God giving supply or God sending supply God itself is the supply when you have God you have the infinity of supply if you had a billion dollars and didn't have God you would have nothing we have had people with a billion dollars that couldn't even eat a meal now when you have the forms of supply without the supply itself you have nothing that's why we have a uh, saying in this country of shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve in three generations because one individual has a consciousness of supply and accumulates it and then very lovingly leaves it to their children and grandchildren who not having the consciousness of supply promptly run through it lose it have it taken away from them and within three generations find themselves back in uh, the place where their ancestors began someday the world will learn the folly of accumulating money for their children and will understand that they only bless their children in proportion as they help to develop a consciousness of supply for their children and not leave the forms of supply to deprive them of the great opportunity that God has given to each one of us to live by our own consciousness that also came up in uh, Hebrew scripture when it was originally taught that the sins of the fathers are visited on the children unto the third and fourth generation but 200 years later it was discovered that this is not true no more shall it be said in Israel that the parents have eaten sour grapes 
and the children's teeth are set on edge for now every man will be rewarded according to his own life and everyone will be punished according to their own misdeeds and we can carry this out into the activity of supply that everyone will be supplied in accord in accordance with their own state of consciousness and everyone will lack in accord with their own state of consciousness well as we begin to perceive that God is our individual consciousness and that God is infinite we begin to perceive the nature of supply as that which is invisible and we no longer judge by appearances as to the amount of our supply nor do we ever come to that uh, place in human experience where there is an absence of supply in our normal experience When experiences come, such as came to Rickenbacker, and uh, experiences that come to others on the desert or in the midst of war or sudden depressions, where there is a temporary absence of forms of supply, then with this wisdom, uh, the years of the locust are quickly restored. Then uh, the flow begins quickly to come. Now. An experience came to me before the one of the fruit that gave me my first glimpse of immortality. I suppose that I was a little more concerned about the subject of dying or death than most people, firstly because in my youth I had always been more or less ill and then I developed a curiosity about this life and uh, I, I wanted to see it and keep watching it and I dreaded the day when I would have to leave it and have to die and uh, for a while it was a very frustrating experience because there you know well it's inevitable it's got to be but we don't want it to be and there comes a little desperate uh, battle to see can't we beat the rat and uh, on this particular day I was driving and for some reason or other this thought of death came to me with all of the distaste that goes with it when I remembered I had just come from the barber shop and uh, I'd had a haircut and a manicure and all of a sudden the thought came to me oh where is that hair they cut off where are those fingernails oh they're in the furnace already but they are not bothering me it doesn't seem to concern me at all that they're in the furnace and uh, I know why because I'm not there with them I'm here and all is well oh that sort of made a difference because quickly I could see they could just as well take the fingers and hand and arm if they wanted it and throw that in the furnace too but I would still be here and so that would not concern me and of course it isn't uh, very difficult to see how you can go through the whole rest of the body and let them throw it all in the furnace since I would still be here separate and apart from that experience and uh, my life my consciousness 
would be going forward. Now when you once you see that, you begin to see that you are something separate and apart from your body. Just as much separate and apart from your body as you are separate and apart from your automobile even while your automobile is carrying you across the mountain. At no part are you a part of an automobile. The automobile is just an instrument or vehicle for your use. But you have no personal contact with it whatsoever, no identity or identification with it. You're not a part of it. You and the automobile are always separate and apart from each other. And so you will learn through this experience, if you will follow it through, that regardless of where your body is, I am right here. Now, as you perceive that, you will see that this I, which I am, is permanently here, eternally here. And then you'll know why God is your true identity, because only God is immortal, only God is eternal, and the nature of God, consciousness, is uh, a continued state of immortality, of eternal being, of eternality. And that is what I am. That is what I individually am, a state of divine consciousness. Now, this that I am, which is immortal, is likewise infinite. And so you realize through this that you are never using up your life. You are never using up your life. You are never using up your strength. You are never using up your span of years. Never, never, because the only you that is exists as uh, the consciousness which uses this as an infinity. Now, that does not mean immortality of the soul and death of the body as it is understood in uh, the orthodox thought. Nor does it mean that this is a hope for us with the experience of the discarding of the body still to be faced. No. No, that may go on for a while since death is the last enemy to be overcome. But if you will perceive this point of your true identity as the consciousness which permeates this body, which uses this body as an instrument or vehicle, you will come into the experience that you witness in nature you will shed this body, not by death, but by the shedding of the skin, or the shedding of the nails, or the shedding of the hair, or the shedding of uh, the uh, atoms or parts that make up the organs and functions of the body, with a constant renewal, just as uh, the bark falls off and new bark is there, the same tree is always there, the same body, just so you will eventually see that this body, yes, even this body, will die daily, will slough off and be renewed so that always this body will remain in its strength, in its health, in its vitality, in its youthfulness. To see God as your individual consciousness, the I of your being, ends these periods of drought. These periods in which not only your supply vanishes, but your body, but the very moment that you perceive that you exist as consciousness, out of that consciousness you get this word that was covenanted when we came out of Egypt, Egypt is darkness and ignorance. Now what is the promise that comes to us as we come out of 
the ignorance and darkness of the Old Testament it's the word I the covenant that was made with us is this I will never leave thee nor forsake thee as I was with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses so I am with you I will always be with you I will be with you unto the end of the world that is the covenant that is the very first thing that happens well let me put it this way the very first time that we have a spiritual inner experience one of the very first things we hear is something like thou art my son or I will never leave thee or fear not or something like that takes place within it's one of the very first experiences we have as we come out of our religious ignorance and darkness into religious wisdom practically everyone I've known who has had a spiritual experience has had it with some form of a promise involved something of an assurance of a presence of an assurance of a power of an assurance of life immortal of an assurance of supply or protection and that then is the first covenant that is made with us as we come out of our religious superstition and ignorance and so we find my spirit remaineth among you now this my which is the my peace that the master spoke of my peace give I unto you not as the world giveth my spirit remaineth with you the spirit presence power consciousness of God remains with you and now you find that the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former once the realization comes that I exist not as body as consciousness I exist not as body but as consciousness as spirit as the very consciousness of God then out of that consciousness comes all of the rest and then we're told that <clears throat> I will fill this house with glory all of these things that beforehand were taken from us you remember the corn and the new wine and the oil all that the ground bringeth forth was uh, to be covered with a drought now we're told that it's restored now in this new consciousness in this realization of true consciousness in this realization of true identity the drought disappears the spirit of God is upon us the spirit of healing of consolation that Isaiah voiced as the Christ when he voiced it so we come to two points one a reminder of the nature of supply which is the infinite invisible appearing as form and once that is realized never again can one be without supply never have I seen the righteous begging bread the righteous are those who are one with truth one with God never has an individual who has known that supply is invisible spiritual omnipresent wherever I am supply is never can that individual be without supply except in those moments of stress or strain as Moses was on the trip from Egypt and uh, then only as a temporary experience but through the realization of truth that drought is quickly uh, ended so it is that as we attain the realization of our true identity as an invisible life so that when we look in the mirror we no longer say look what I look like we say oh my body needs a little jerking up somewhere 
We don't identify what we see in the mirror with ourselves because that is not I. That is my body. But the very moment that I realize I am I, my body begins to change form. The body only looks like what it does look like because we ignorantly have been identifying uh, that body as ourselves. That's all. Through false identification, we have made this body look like what it looks like. Whereas, uh, with right identification, we can quickly begin to change its nature so that we can say ten years from now that we look ten years younger than we look now. It can be so, and in many cases it is so, and in every case of reala realization it is to some degree so. I have witnessed in my experience dozens and dozens of people in their 80s and 90s who were far, far, far from any such appearance, and only because of the degree of their realization of this truth, because out of the consciousness of God cannot come age, limitation, weakness, or death. So it's a question of whether or not we realize ourselves to be God consciousness or mortal, material, human, limited, finite consciousness. Out of that must come all of the other. Now, it is the same way We are in the habit of walking down the street and seeing people and believing that we are seeing people when we are only seeing their bodies. Now, the first miracle that comes into your experience comes when you learn consciously to walk down the street and begin to declare to yourself, thank you, Father, I'm not fooled by the appearances. I know this is not John Bill Mary. I know uh, that behind uh, those eyes, invisible to sight, is the man of God, spiritual being, true identity, Christhood. You'll be surprised that within two or three days, changes begin to come into your own experience just through the ability to perceive uh, the invisible Christ where beforehand you were seeing human beings walking the earth. That's when, uh, you see, all of our work is based on and work. In other words, there must be a conscious realization of truth. There is no mysterious God outside sitting around waiting to bless us because we met here this morning. Whatever blessing comes into our experience comes through a transformation of consciousness that takes place within us. Turn ye and live. God has no pleasure in your dying. But it's turn ye. Be ye renewed by the transforming of your mind. Every blessing that comes into your experience except the temporary blessing that comes through your practitioner or teacher, every real and permanent blessing must come through a transformation of your consciousness, through an activity of truth in your consciousness. It is after you are instructed and taught and lifted up to some measure of realization, you must walk out on the street and not be fooled by appearances, but see through the eye of the human being or the animal or the tree and say, no longer do I believe that is a coconut tree. Now I know it's the form or body of the coconut tree. The coconut tree is inside, invisible to sight. Ah, once you know that, you will know why in its season the coconuts will appear externally. Why? 
because the coconut tree is so busy manufacturing them inside and we think we are looking at a coconut tree out here when all we're seeing is a bark of the tree one that sloughs off day by day and ever is renewed by an invisible activity so it is with us you are not seeing me and I am not seeing you there is an invisible activity going on within me which is an activity of truth in my consciousness that activity of truth in my consciousness is renewing me day by day physically mentally morally financially whatever way is necessary for my earthly experience this inner consciousness is renewing day by day day by day the manna falls day by day this inner selfhood which is my invisible being is manufacturing the particular form of coconuts that I may need for daily experience now each one of us is uh, the same God consciousness since there is only one therefore the degree of our demonstration lies in the degree of our conscious realization of the truth we all have the same substance we all have the same life we all have the same God we all have the same uh, inner activity but the degree of our individual realization of it determines the degree of our demonstration of it our source is infinite the degree of our realization of the inf infinite nature of our source determines the degree of our outer expression now this is true not merely in the things that we call supply like money food clothing housing this is equally true in uh, this house this house which is a vehicle this house must be renewed day by day and season by season by the same activity of truth in consciousness by the same realization uh, that I am not what appears outwardly I am the spiritual life force which is functioning uh, from within to the without it isn't I have a life force I am that life force that life force constitutes my true and individual being the more I realize that the more it flows in uh, harmonious and infinite form and variety you see it is a matter of right identification a right identity who am I what am I am I that which is visible or am I the invisible which acts to produce visibly none of that hinges the entire secret of our harmonious existence healings are brought about between practitioner and patient only by the realization of the practitioner that God constitutes individual being and that God is an infinite life an eternal and an harmonious life and a steadfast realization of this truth is all that is necessary the whole thing is right identity the moment we think of each other as human beings who have to be patched up then in that degree are we just practicing some other form of materia medica but the moment that we withdraw from all attempts to patch up improve heal correct or reform and abide in the realization of this truth God is individual being God is the only identity God is the source God is the invisibility of you and that constitutes your true being you are the invisible life force your body is one of the forms which you assume your dollars are another form which you assume your home is another form which you assume your business is another form but you are the animating uh, life of your being of your body of your home of your business do you see that 
you, you, just as much as you are the directive force of your automobile, so are you the animating force of your entire career. Let's meditate a few minutes. Now the reason that we don't have to take thought for our life, that is to consciously direct it, is for the same reason that the uh, fruit tree doesn't have to take any thought for producing its fruit. That which it really is in spiritual identity, being God, operates without the necessity of conscious thought or uh, anxious thought. In the same wise, we have no need ever to be concerned. Let me have this straight. I don't want you to think for a minute that I mean that we're to stop thinking, that I mean or, or planning or, or conducting our affairs in normal way. But what I mean is this, that instead of consciously setting about to direct your affairs, the first step is the inner meditation in which you receive that click or awareness of the presence of God which shows that this invisible God is working in you and for you and through you then it will give you whatever right thoughts, right direction, right guidance is needed for your experience. Once you have learned the uh, practice of meditation up to the point of contact before venturing out of the house or on any of the daily affairs, then you will find if it is necessary for you to go someplace where you hadn't planned on going, the thought or idea will come to you to do it and you'll do it. If uh, it is necessary to place an ad, you'll go out and place an ad and wonder why. In other words, you will always be led to take the right human footstep we're not going to destroy the human mind. We're not going to destroy the activity of the human body by saying we don't have to go to business or we don't have to design new houses or new dresses. We do. But as the click is received inside, as the contact is made, that takes over and certainly reduces our human footsteps by millions and always is at hand available to tell us what these next steps are that we must take. And uh, while we take them, it performs the work that is given for us to do. We merely go through the motions uh, of carrying it out on the outer plane while it goes before us to make the crooked places straight, to prepare the way, to do everything necessary for our protection, for our guidance, for our direction, for our support. And so it is that it is only when we come that far to trust the action of the infinite invisible that we will not make a human step without its inner assurance that we can be certain that we're on the right path on the outer. Now you noticed this morning that our meditation went far longer than usual and for a reason that it just did not come to the point of release. It did not come to the point where it had taken over. And so there had to be a patience and waiting because had I started before it came, the only thing you would have gotten is my stored up memory of truth in which is no power whatsoever. There is no power in our memorized truth. There is no power in the manner of yesterday. Nothing, nothing. Unless a message can come forth imbued with a spirit, unless it can come forth out of the consciousness of God, it comes to you with no power. It just comes as something you hear and probably afterward forget or criticize. And rightly so. I have no objection to anybody criticizing anything that comes out of my mouth that didn't come out through the activity of God. But that is why I will wait and wait. And some students have been with me in classes 
when uh, 10 minutes after the class started I said that's enough tonight we're going home and we went home and some have been with me when uh, the class didn't start we just sat and had a meditation I said I'm sorry the class is over go home and we went home why oh I'm sure you know I could sit and talk for an hour but I also can assure you of this that if I did there would be no substance in it there would be no activity no life no healing it wouldn't be the word of God it would just be that which Joel remembered and that I can tell you is not the bread of life the master knew what the bread of life is my doctrine is not mine but his that sent me and so if I wait until the click comes if I wait until the answer comes then what comes out of me is spontaneous you may have heard the words before you may have heard everything before makes no difference that has nothing to do with it the spirit is flowing through those words and it is now the word of God it is quick and sharp and powerful do you see that and it does produce an effect out here in what we call this visible world so we must be I had a call this morning and I asked that the man wait one hour before doing what he had in mind doing that instant wait wait one hour don't do it until God is on the scene give me a chance to meditate to ponder until I get the assurance God is on the scene then do anything you like because I don't even care then if you do a wrong thing it will be corrected I don't care how many wrong things any of us do as long as we first have uh, the click of God because if we do make a mistake it isn't likely that we will not certainly not many but if we do it will be corrected before any damage is done our function is to be sure that the blight of human consciousness isn't going to touch our crops that we uh, are imbued with the same spirit this covenant that was given us in the beginning the assurance of I am with you I will never leave you nor forsake you whithersoever thou goest I will go then we can say ah I am the invisible being and all of this out here this is all the visible form and while this is sloughing off every day it's renewed every day it is renewed you don't even see that which was sloughed off and which is gone but it is and every day it is renewed and so from head to foot we should be renewed not only head to foot inside and outside and so must the pocketbook or bank account be renewed day by day not yes 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 today we greet with us a lady from Canada and uh, tomorrow we will be greeting a man from California and we hope a lady from Australia thank you